few words about Tushar. Tushar is a technical director in Samsung Semiconductor India R&D, SSIR. He's a member of technical leader and a past chair of communication and connectivity center of excellence at SSIR. He has over 20 years of professional experience in wireless communication and embedded uh, domain, spe specifically with Exynos system on chip at Samsung Electronics. He has about 40 plus applied patents, 20 plus grand patents, and 30 plus technical com contributions, papers and journals in various topics like 3GPP. And Tishar is also a notable um, you know, innovator and entrepreneur and technology evangelist at SSIR. He's also a senior member of IEEE and executive committee member of IEEE Cosmic uh, Bangalore ch chapter. He also participated in uh, Stanford Ignite and also have certification in entrepreneurship and innovation from the Graduate School of Business, Stan Stanford University. He holds bachelor's degree in computer engineering from uh, Bits Institute of Technology, Misra, India, and Master of Science in Wireless Communication and Networks from Inter International Institute of Information Technology, Bangalore. With that introduction, over to you, Tushar. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tushar, um, Tushar Rent, and I work with Samsung Semiconductor India R&D Center. Today, um, I'm going to present a tutorial uh, to all of you on beyond 5G and 6G wireless communication. So what I'm going to do is, uh, in the next slide, I'll set the agenda for this tutorial, and we'll take it from there on. In this presentation, in this tutorial, we're going to quickly look at um, what brought us to 5G in terms of the technology changes, primarily on wireless communication and a little bit on the core network side. And after I've done that, I'll um, present to you beyond 5G and 6G, which is the main topic for this tutorial. Uh, we'll look at what is possible and what is expected uh, to be there in the future, um, possibly in two, 2025 and beyond. And I'll look at a few specific enabling technologies, um, specifically on aerial communication, uh, wireless or AI, and intelligent services. So these uh, would be um, broadly that are things that would be covered in this tutorial. If you look at the 5G requirements um, from where we were on 4G and what uh, was expected at the beginning of 2010 2012, uh, that's when the 5G research was shaping up. So if you look at, uh, I'm, I, I'm sure a lot of you would have seen this, uh, this kind of uh, information being shared in the past as well. So if you look at this grid over here, uh, this is pretty much like a spider web, right? So we see that uh, in the 4G era, the inside um, are uh, marked for 4G and the outer bound is for the 5G. So if you look at on each and every vector, if you look at the peak data rate, uh, while uh, there was up to one gigabit per second uh, support in case of 4G or LTE, long-term evolution uh, network, in case of 5G, it is expected to hit about 20 gigabit per second. So that itself was a 20x um, improvement from what we had then uh, in 4G to what is expected to be in 5G. If you look at the user experience data rate, um, this is primarily talking about per user uh, data rates. So there was, a, there was a 10 megabit per second kind of a throughput that a user would actually get in a 4G network. And in a 5G network, it was expected um, that 100 megabit per second kind of per user throughput would be achieved. Uh, even if you look at the spectral efficiency or how much uh, bits per hertz per second can be obtained, uh, this, there was an expected three times uh, increase in case of uh, 5G as compared to 4G. Um, in terms of mobility or what is the peak uh, speed that can be supported. So there is expected 500 km per hour kind of a high speed scenarios to be supported in uh, 5G networks. Latency will come down uh, from 10 millisecond to 1 millisecond in case of 5G. 
and the connection density, which is primarily to say how many devices can be supported per kilometer square. So there is a 10x uh, increase from what was on 4G to what is on 5G. Similarly, on the network energy efficiency, while we talk about higher bit rates, higher spectral efficiency, support of higher mobility, but the network efficiency should improve. So while uh, we have to increase it by 100, 100 times more than what it is on 4G. And similarly, on the when you talk about peak data rate, uh, there's also the capacity per area, right? So what is the megabit per second per meter square? So while we had 0.1 megabit per second per meter square, there is expected 10 megabit per second per meter square. So while these are numbers, what it essentially means is the technologies that um, are adopted or implemented in case of 5G has to be far more superior to be able to do that. While of course spectrum it's itself um, is another thing that gets added. We have much fatter pipe in 5G compared to 4G, but still at a, at a core technology level, we have to improve, uh, we have to make it optimal so that we can utilize the available spectrum uh, in, a, in a much better form. So uh, 5G is broadly uh, you know, divided into three sub-user, sub-use sub case categories, right? The first one is called the enhanced mobile broadband, which talks about basically the data rate. So if you see in case of 4G, uh, while we have one Gbps, uh, the peak rate in 5G is 20 Gbps. So, uh, and user rate, as we explained, it has to go from 100, uh, 100 to 1000 Mbps, right? Uh, that's the kind of expected improvement in case of 5G. So uh, this is broadly to say that certain applications like high definition videos, virtual reality and augmented reality would be possible uh, with 5G, 5G as the wireless uh, communication media. So it's just an example to show that in case of 4G, while it takes 240 seconds to download a HD movie, uh, in 5G it can be done less than, less than six seconds. Second category of use cases is on ultra reliable low latency, which is to say that while the latency is low, the communication is also reliable. So there would be a lot of redundancy that would be added in the communication so that the data doesn't really fail. It actually reaches to the end point, right? So using the ultra reliable low latency subclass of use cases, certain uh, use specific use cases like remote, remote take robot control, and then you have connected autonomous vehicles and interactive gaming would be very much possible. Um, in this in this era of 5G. So this is just an example to show that in case of 4G, uh, while the messaging, the delay takes uh, takes a toll and you cannot actually do autonomous vehicles in case of 5G, it is the response is so quick that you can actually do autonomous uh, car over the network, right? The third category is on the uh, massive machine type communication, which is to say, talk about how many devices, the smart homes and the smart smart use cases of putting IoT nodes um, are well connected over the network, right? So connection density is a key here. So while in case of 4G, we had 10 raised to five devices per kilometer square, it will go 10 times. And the typical use cases are smart cities, smart agriculture, uh, things like that, right? So as it uh, kind of shows that there's a 10X improvement expected in case of uh, 5G. Now, this is just to set uh, some context broadly to say that every generation of communication, there are certain more stringent requirements that it has to support. And having said that, uh, in order to achieve this, there would be certain technologies, there would be certain features, certain communication methods that would be applied, right? So a few, uh, I'll take a very quick glance on what are the things that has changed between uh, 4G and 5G in that perspective. All right, so uh, when we talk about um, the, the technology differentiation or the features uh, of 5G, um, what I'll do is I'll cover the feature differences in physical layer, MAC layer, and the core network. It will just help us understand that uh, differentiation or uh, enabling technology coming in different layers, how they can together uh, achieve the targets given to a new system, a new wireless system. For example, if you talk about physical layer, right? The most important uh, resource for the physical layer is the spectrum itself, right? So we have, uh, while 4G was deployed in uh, lower lower frequency bands, if you talk about 5G, 
we have 26 gigahertz 28 gigahertz millimeter wave range of um, frequency spectrum carrier frequency spectrum which can be uh, deployed now that comes in with a challenge uh, due to higher attenuation at higher frequency uh, you can perhaps not uh, have a great coverage so the traditional system of uh, doing uh, uh, omnidirectional transmission is not applicable uh, in 5g so 5g had to use a new technique called beam forming where a set of antenna uh, panels are used to focus the energy in one direction so what what essentially it would mean is it can cover users to a larger distance but only in one particular direction so this would also mean that there needs to be several beams that has to be managed or has to be emitted from the base station now if you want to do that there's a, there are new concepts or there are new methods to be deployed for beam management and how the user can move from one beam to the other beam given that it is mobile and there can there can be certain regions where the beam cannot reach because of shadowing or because of blockages right so all of that are new techniques that are deployed in case of 5g now these are uh, pretty much uh, applicable to higher frequency ranges but in the lower frequency range uh, in the sub 6 gigahertz range we continue using massive mimo and concepts of spatial multiplexing and transmit diversity can be utilized uh, in sub 6 gigahertz kind of deployment now with beam forming uh, while we can use uh, analog beam formers and digital beam formers uh, both of them have their own benefits and uh, in terms of power performance and complexity uh, in case of 5G, we use a hybrid beam former where there are the certain things done in the digital domain and certain things done in the analog domain. So we can have multiple beams uh, and the beam management uh, using the hybrid beam forming system in case of 5G. So that's one part of the physical layer. The second part is on the flexible multi numerology support. So typically in case of LTE or 3G, the system was very rigid. The entire slot and mini slot structure was fixed. But what happens is in case of uh, 5G, since there are different service requirements for enhanced mobile broadband uh, and ultra reliable low latency, there are certain latency and reliability component additionally added, uh, we need different kind of a slot structure. So we need different subcarrier spacing um, or different size of uh, uh, size of the slot. So depending on that, uh, a multiple uh, numerology support is given in the physical layer design so that certain slots a certain time frequency grid is allocated to enhanced mobile broadband and certain time frequency grid is given to ultra reliable low latency so subcarrier spacing is chosen in such a way that it reduces the latency in case of ultra reliable low latency while the enhanced mobile broadband is pretty much like the lt system where the focus is on on the data rate right so that was another feature that was added in in terms of uh, <clears throat> uh, in, in 5g now with the advent of computation complexity i mean there are processing processors which can do more computations so we could adopt a much higher uh, uh, computation intensive channel coding and bringing in the benefit in in terms of achieving uh, better signal to noise ratio so if you look at ldpc uh, which is one of the chosen uh, channel coding schemes for data channels we have uh, similarly we have polar codes which uh, works on small control data much better so both of these technologies were adopted on the physical layer for transmission and reception of data and control respectively. Now, in terms of uh, uh, you know, improving the energy efficiency, uh, there's a concept of bandwidth part. So if you look at the entire carrier, you know, uh, when you talk about higher frequency band and much fatter pipe, it means the user has to continue decoding the entire fat pipe for its own data and control. Now that would be energy intensive. So what is done is, uh, from the UE perspective or from the user terminal perspective, a certain bandwidth region is allocated. So that's called a bandwidth part. So if user is only need to, uh, the user's requirement is only to monitor its respective bandwidth part, then a lot of system efficiency can be brought in in terms of energy. So user doesn't have to scan the entire band, it only scans a certain region uh, and becomes narrow band from the perspective of user, but a wide band from the system perspective. So that's uh, broadly the features at the physical layer which is kind of enabling 5g right and similarly when we talk about beyond 5g and 6g we will we'll see what kind of technologies uh, at least in this tutorial uh, we have a few technologies to discuss and we'll try to see if they can actually do any of this or not right so on the mac layer and higher layers uh, there are certain differences uh, that were adopted uh, in case of 5g uh, primarily to uh, improve the data processing speed as well as try to make the system little leaner 
right? So number one on the fast data processing, while we move from sub gig gigabit per second to multi gigabit per second, there's a need to do a lot of uh, advanced data packet uh, you know, creation in case of 5G. So if you look at uh, 5G versus 4G, there are some differences uh, done in the layer two, uh, primarily to ensure that the data is actually prepared faster and uh, kept ready in the buffer so that the moment there is allocation or there is a, a scheduling that is happening for this user terminal, the data can be pushed in and just send it out. Because there's, there's so much more to do in terms of data processing uh, compared to LTE. We already uh, want a 20x in improvement in terms of uh, no, uh, multi gigabit per second data rate. So all of that translates to a simple, simplified data processing and faster data processing and try to keep it non-real time, keep uh, the packets um, already in the queue uh, in the physical layer and the moment there is a packet to be sent out, just add the headers and send it out over the air. Right? So that's one of the most important thing that was done. Uh, and also in order to, since we have different quality of service requirements um, come in, uh, coming from enhanced mobile broadband, ultra reliable low latency and massive machine time communication, it was essential to do packet level quality of service. Now, in order to do that, uh, there was a requirement to add a new layer and have a quality of service service flows. So that was a new thing that was added in 5G. So we have this new layer called Service Data Adaptation Protocol, SDAP, which was added over uh, over uh, PDCP. Right. So that manages the quality of service and ensures that every data bearer uh, is able to deliver uh, the required quality of service, depending on what service it has been mapped to. Now, in terms of the uh, radio resource control, which is one of the important layers which manages the connection state, uh, there are two things that was done. One was uh, there's a lot of broadcast information on the system, uh, what, what the system of 5G has, whether it is allowed to camp on that system, whether what are the parameters that has to be applied from the user in order to reach the uh, network. So there is a, so, so previously there was, a broadcast kind of a system information design like all the time it is being broadcasted now that in order to reduce the signaling overhead it was brought into a on-demand system information so whether whenever a user requires a specific uh, information from the network it would try to do a random access procedure and try to uh, do system information request and then uh, there's a response uh, from the network to, uh, to the user in terms of um, uh, the specific response to that system information need. However, there is still a little bit of broadcast happening, but not everything is broadcasted. Most of the things have been pushed into a on-demand system information kind of design. Now, uh, there's another thing that was done in the radio resource control, which was primarily to bring in lower latency and longer battery life. So initially, uh, the system had idle and uh, connected states, but now, uh, there's a new uh, state called inactive being brought in. So with inactivity, uh, all the uh, configurations are kind of frozen. It is just stored. And the moment a user needs to go back to uh, uh, connected, it can just go back to connected from inactive. It doesn't have to you know, go from inactive to idle and idle to connected, which is a long tail in terms of time for it to reach to connected state. So these are some of the enabling technologies that was or enabling features in the uh, in the Mac and um, L3 layers, right, of the 5G system. So this is again to give you a context on that technology differentiation or the features uh, or the enablements can happen in any of the layers, and not necessarily it needs to be uh, where it needs to be in terms of like just the physical layer or just the spectrum or just the transmission and reception. It can happen in any of the layers as long as we are able to meet the requirements together. So that's on the Mac. So this slide summarizes the differences between 4G and 5G in terms of the radio interface. And most of it we have covered. We've talked about the carrier frequency, uh, how a wider spectrum uh, is, um, is possible uh, in case of 5G. Uh, we discussed about beamforming MIMO. We discussed about the channel coding. Uh, one thing that we've not yet discussed was on the carrier bandwidth. So uh, carrier bandwidth is typically how fat a pipe uh, we can give, right? So in above six gigahertz range, uh, we can have each carrier of uh, 400 megahertz. So if you talk about millimeter wave or uh, 26, 28 gigahertz, we can each uh, carrier is 400 megahertz wide and we can have 16 of such carriers which adds up to 6.4 gigahertz. So that's the kind of size 
uh, in terms of how many uh, how fat how fat uh, the uh, the bandwidth can be allocated in case of 5G and below 6 gigahertz we can have a maximum carrier size of 100 megahertz compare this with LTE we have maximum 20 megahertz per carrier and only five carriers can be aggregated so that brings in 100 megahertz so this is the most important enabler for high peak throughput in terms of latency because of the flexible um, numerology we could have different slot sizes uh, 0 0.0625 so this is like the smallest uh, slot length and this will be used for low latency scenarios and if you compare with LT we just had one millisecond fixed slot design so uh, that is kind of rigid in terms of uh, the deployment the RAN function split is basically how uh, the radio access network uh, can be split right so we had in case of LT uh, we could just do a radio unit split so a radio unit could be deployed in different locations and all of them connect back to the central node using fiber but here because the function can be split uh, across centralized and distributed it brings in much more flexibility and scalability uh, uh, in terms of network design and network deployment we discussed about the adaptive bandwidth uh, ue uh, uh, per user based depending on how much your bandwidth part is allocated so object that brings in uh, greater uh, power consumption reduction right in, in case of 5g but in LT, the entire bandwidth is for the user to really scan so the entire 20 megahertz has to be scanned by the user so um, that would actually not be so user friendly so power friendly so as to say right so that's the kind of a summary of uh, the technology uh, technology difference on the radio layer uh, which we discussed right this slide covers a survey from GSMA in terms of the 5G deployment, the actual deployment of 5G uh, network. So while um, early in 2018, there were a lot of uh, trials happening across the world, uh, right from Europe, USA, and South Korea. Uh, the actual commercial deployment happened first in South Korea in the month of April 2019. Uh, where all the entire nation uh, was 5G ready in terms of commercial deployment. And just after a few days, I think it was just a day or two, uh, USA uh, got its first commercial network in Verizon. So that was uh, just for the world first part. But yeah, of course, it's, uh, it's not, it doesn't stop there. The entire 2019 and 2020, we have seen a lot of deployments happening and through 2021 as well. So uh, today we have close to 200 operators across the world really uh, supporting uh, or really having 5G users and it is going to go up right uh, the growth of launch commercial 5G networks if you see uh, it's going to go up uh, from quarter quarter by quarter uh, all the way to 2025 so uh, that's the kind of uh, growth that the 5G network will see in the coming days but while this is about the commercial part of it uh, the the uh, the active research on beyond 5G uh, has already begun. When we talk about the third generation partnership project, which is uh, which defines the standard for 5G, uh, today we are uh, release seven in release 17. Release 18 work has already started, and I think post release 18 and some part of release 18 work will also be realized in in the sixth generation network which is about 2030 right so we are in 2022 now we have about eight years then we'll see the first commercial 6g network and before that we'll see a lot of uh, early deployments and early research um, and early uh, progress coming both from the standards as well as from the research labs so that's kind of the summary that i wanted to give on 5g before i move on to the next part of my presentation which talks about beyond 5g and 6g communication so with that we come to the section on beyond 5g and 6g so over here we'll first discuss about the kind of requirements that the future uh, has for the wireless communication and then we'll look at uh, some enabling technologies and specifically we'll um, a deep dive into aerial communication and intelligent surfaces and I'll briefly touch upon wireless for AI. While we speak a lot about AI uh, in general um, and what, what are the applications of AI in wireless, uh, in this talk I'll focus a little bit on what a wireless can do for AI, right? So that sense, in that sense, like how the edge computing and how the decentralized 
AI uh, is and what does it mean for wireless communication to enable that to happen. Right. So uh, based on uh, some of the market research on how the mobile traffic would be increasing in the next 10 years. So uh, today, uh, if we see in 2021, 2022, we are around 2000 exabytes of traffic per month and it is expected to go up to 5000 plus exabytes per month which is if you compare from 2020 to 2013 that's a typical scale of 5g to 60 about 80 times increase in mobile traffic these are data uh, from active market research uh, reported from uh, by itu as well and so that is one of the most important requirement in terms of enhanced mobile broadband so the broadband traffic is going to increase by 80 times now if you look at uh, the kind of uh, uh, multi multimedia requirements right so today we are talking about 2k and 4k ultra hd television uh, we are already seeing 8k kind of uh, products in the market and typically for a 64k digital cinema you would require about 256 gigabits per second to really happen um, in, in real time so uh, that's that's the kind of uh, uh, requirement in terms of throughput or data rate again coming from multimedia alone right so we have 10 bit even if you I mean just you can just see how it is in scale right so 10 bit at uh, this resolution at 24 frames per second it itself means about 126 27 megabytes per second which is about 1 gbps that's the current uh, kind of uh, concurrent kind of limit that we already have and if you just scale it to 64k that's even going to be like two to six times what we have today in terms of the throughput now if you look at uh, out of this entire mobile traffic if you just look at the video you can see the video is most 75 percent of the traffic is all about video that's why this conversion of the video was so important, right? So these, this, this together talks about both the um, increase in traffic as well as the direction or basically the the content which is more, uh, which which poses more requirements in 6G. I mean, in, in this kind of a timeline, of next 10 years. So 75% of the traffic would be uh, video. And we're seeing it's not only consumption, it's also production. So a lot of, uh, if you look at the current Insta Insta Instagram generation, people are just uh, randomly taking videos, making reels, making TikTok videos, and just uploading, right? So everybody has become like a content creator in today's world. And that's uh, that's the kind of trend uh, that is going to you know, sustain at least for the next 10 years. And uh, if you look at some of the other use cases, today we have video to video telephony. If you look at a hologramic kind of a requirement, no? so a one, one particular hologram, if you see, it takes about one gigabyte per centimeter cube to be, you know, actually um, uh, this kind of data has to be generated to actually recreate a hologram. And if you just couple it with the multi multimedia calling, you can assume how much of additional uh, data requirements would come on to the, uh, to the network. And we already have, we're talking about virtual reality, we're talking about virtual reality uh, environment and how people will interact in those kind of requirements. The Super HDR, VR will take about 13.6 uh, GBPS, right? So that's the kind of overall uh, shift in terms of the uh, multimedia and the kind of mobile broadband requirement. So that is one of the most important areas of the 6G or the beyond 5G requirement. So this is what needs to be supported in the future networks. And that's where newer newer technologies have to be designed or have to be brought in to really meet these kind of targets. While we discussed on the mobile broadband, specifically there are certain other use cases uh, which are pretty much uh, built up from what we have seen in the 5G era or what we had the requirements for 5G systems where, uh, for example, if you look at latency, we talked about very low latency or ultra reliable low latency communication. In going ahead with the same, uh, there would be another requirement of zero perceived latency, primarily to bring a tactile internet or transfer of internet of skill uh, from one place to the other. Uh, basically something that is that requires us to collaborate across two geographies, but at a very low latency. For example, if 
there is there is a musician playing in one location and another another musician playing in another location how can they collaborate together uh, but music is very much delay sensitive so um, this kind of a zero perceived latency would really help uh, to to build those kind of things or those kind of use cases there's a, another use case of um, doing uh, robotic um, operation so where the doctor is sitting in one location but a robotic arm is actually operating on a patient and the doctor can remotely control and interact with this robotic arm and perform the surgery with precision so this is another requirement which would probably be realized in the next 10 years of course on the internet of things um, with the kind of growth or the kind of devices that get connected we see will be we believe that there would be around 500 billion things that would be need to be connected in the next 10 years requiring three times more ip traffic and out of that 40 percent would be machine to machine kind of communications that's the kind of another requirement bucket for 6g if we look at positioning, uh, we would have uh, flying drones which needs to be operated remotely. So it's very essential to have super precision positioning for these kind of use cases. We have uh, factory automation. We have uh, industry, um, industrial uh, Internet of Things and navigation happening inside buildings. So all of that would require super high precision. So that's another requirement that is coming in for 6G. And if you look at the device form factor from where we had like a smartphone in the late 2010s to actually moving into wearables and other electronic gadgets with smartphones or uh, smart watches or the smart gear we are in uh, where and all the things coming into home appliances as well we what we would see is in the next 10 years we will have ubiquitous devices basically uh, people will interact start interacting with surfaces and the computing would be moved on to the sh uh, to the edge so that's another direction which needs to be taken into account before designing a system so this there would be split computing happening something happening at uh, a centralized unit within the vicinity of a user and some surfaces through which the user can interact so all of that is a possibility and uh, we have to write uh, technologies which can enable that to happen so that's primarily the kind of requirements we see in addition to the mobile broadband alone which would be, uh, which would be required to be supported in the next next phase of the wireless communication so this is another representation of the requirements uh, in a very similar fashion as what we saw uh, when we uh, discussed on the 5g like how from 4g to 5g how the vectors uh, along the all the vectors how the growth would be in terms of data traffic or spectrum efficiency and so on and so forth so again here we see on this web that while we talked about a 20 gbps kind of a, a throughput map uh, peak data rate in uh, in 5g we expect more than one terabyte per second uh, in in 6g so that is uh, that is a huge huge leap right uh, and then if you look at the user experience data rate while we would talked about 100 megabit per second in case of 5g we uh, the expectation is to move towards a 1 gigabit per second kind of a throughput per user and this is the user experience data rate this that's again uh, 10 10 fold increase right if you look at spectrum efficiency uh, we are moving from five times more being more efficient in terms of bits per second per hertz uh, on, on the 6G system. The mobility uh, will be moved from 500 km per hour to about a thousand and a little more than thousand km per hour. This is like super high speed uh, train. We are talking about hyperloop and things like that. If you look at latency and we talked about zero perceived latency, the latency has, will drop from one millisecond to in the factor of decimals like the 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 millisecond of latency further further reduction in latency the connection density will again see a 10x improvement between 5g and 6g the network efficiency will again be 100 times more than what it would be in 5g and the area uh, traffic capacity will move from towards one in gigabit per second per meter square right so that's uh, overall huge in terms of the requirements that we have put ourselves uh, for, uh, against for the 6G communication. So this would require a rethinking 
on the entire technology space we have to enable bring in all kind of enablement across all kind of layers in the system and see uh, what else can we do beyond what we did in five to really achieve this uh, this set of requirements this is a very interesting um, study and a presentation um, and, and, and uh, an article a paper by some of the leading researchers in 6g and they talk about uh, the 6g vision so largely uh, if you look at a very uh, at a very macro level uh, it would be a mix of a heterogeneous network not only terrestrial but there will be a non terrestrial part to it which is around satellite integration we will have the high altitude platforms and low altitude platforms like the aerial base stations bringing in certain value into the uh, system and increasing the coverage and capacity of the network several use cases uh, would get enabled which would be like split computing uh, maybe aut autonomous cars real really realize the way uh, we expected them to you know really work like in a driverless manner uh, remote surgery internet of skills getting trans getting really realized so uh, it's another perspective which is very similar to what we have covered so far on broadly on the requirements and the kind of uh, 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 push across each of the uh, each of the vector that we discussed on peak throughput on latency and capacity on user density and so on and so forth all right so uh, there's another way to look at um, it i mean if we just forget 6g or beyond 5g for a moment we just look at what is going really going to happen in the next 10 years we look at smart materials that would in a way fuel the uh, ar and vr because we will be surrounded by touch sensitive materials and this would lead to a massive surge in lifelike virtual reality and augmented reality we could be able to project anywhere including in air and that would mean that true holographic calls would become a need and human palm may actually become a natural smart and if you look at uh, the tactile internet which is like the moment we reduce latency we can actually have interaction over the internet which are uh, really close to human senses so if 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 i can interact with somebody across the world and um, uh, and it is as uh, quick as what i can perceive or feel uh, it's very easy to collaborate it's very easy to you know, feel that it's really tactile in nature of course uh, we discussed about and we heard a lot about artificial intelligence that uh, the whole world all the all the uh, process centric things would actually be automated uh, if you look at advances in biosensors and nanobot the nano nanobots it will really revolutionize the healthcare so semiconductor nano manufacturization and smart eye smart tattoo these would be some of the things that would actually see in the next 10 years and of course uh, our uh, dear subject on autonomous vehicles and drones will become prevalent because uh, it is possible to have really low latency and ultra highly uh, reliable communication so all of this would actually mean that we are moving towards a multi gbps data rates for most devices there would be huge number of devices in the network and of course we talked about latency and this would become sub millisecond into end latency and near perfect reliability so that is the direction so these are again the same same three or four vectors along which the communication uh, will evolve right so we'll we'll look at uh, these four requirements and see some of the enabling technology that uh, actually um, would be uh, available in next 10 years and we'll deep dive into a few in this tutorial so if you look at the timelines um, today we are around 2022 right and pre 6g work has actually started um, even starting 2020 and uh, there are a lot of uh, programs in europe and a lot of government push is already happening on the 6g research um, and itu has also started a study focus focus group on the study on network 2030 and there are certain initiatives across in the um, industry uh, academy or partnership areas like ieee and uh, so so largely to say that uh, there are different different bodies which have started studying and looking at the possible enablement technologies they are building uh, pocs for uh, for the for the future and some of the emerging technologies in all of these projects are on aerial communication ai and wireless terahertz communication 
edge and fog computing, faster than Nyquist, free space optics, intelligent reflective services. So I'll, I'll pick a few of these topics. Not everything requires a separate, um, you know, separate uh, discussion. So I'll just uh, pick up some of the topics which are closer to my area of work and we'll, we'll discuss in the coming slides. On this slide, we have just captured some of the key technologies. Uh, again, um, not everything uh, is covered here. So one of the important uh, focus areas is on aerial communication. So when, when we say aerial communication, it's largely to bring in a non-terrestrial network into the equation. So today we have macro base stations, small cells, which are terrestrial in nature. They are grounded. Um, and elevated at a certain um, at, at a certain height and trying to cover uh, the, the the users on ground. However, uh, with non-terrestrial network, we'll have uh, networks uh, at different altitudes, right from satellites to high altitude, and we'll discuss about these in detail. To uh, to flying uh, UAVs and then to low low flying drones. Uh, so that's how the coverage can be given on demand. Uh, to the users on ground and what is the advantage so advantages are ubiquitous coverage we have ultra high capacity possibility and the backhaul is also becomes wireless and it can be demand based the capacity can be uh, increased however there are key challenges if you talk about satellite there is long propagation delay and sometimes to reach to a certain distance there is a power consumption issue also in the user so depending on what is the need where we have to deploy one of them uh, can be used, right? So that's another way to look at it. Since we are supporting heterogeneous network, not everywhere you will need a satellite coverage. Maybe in certain areas it can be satellite, certain areas you can just augment with drones and so on and so forth. So that's one of the important um, area that would enable uh, the, the, the high capacity and uh, the elastic nature of the uh, network can be really realized in 6G using aerial communication. Second important key focus area is AI in wireless. So there are certain applications in the core network, in the radio access network, and in the user terminal where uh, there's a lot of automation that can be done. There can be a lot of machine learning algorithms that can do easy detection, and you don't need to exchange a lot of data between the two nodes, and certain um, learning um, can be applied at each of the, each of the uh, it will help in reducing the feedback, right? So there is, of course, uh, there is efficiency which will automatically come in, and of course, uh, with the with using the right uh, feed without using the within, without using enough feedback, you can improve the coverage and capacity, right from the RAN as well as on the core, and of course on the on the on the user equipment as well. So another important uh, key technology which I would not be covering in this topic is on the terahertz communication. So this is like communication in frequency range of 300 gigahertz to 3 terahertz and this would this is uh, pretty much like the mm wave in 5g now we're moving towards terahertz uh, waves in case of 6g right so of course there's a vast spectrum availability in that terahertz, terahertz range and of course uh, as we move higher in the frequency the wavelength gets reduced so packing of ultra large number of antennas is possible and that would help enhance the beam forming gains that is possible in this system. Of course, the challenges are humongous. There are RF components and oscillators and LNAs which needs to be designed to really support operating at these frequency. And uh, the, the kind of propagation uh, that the terahertz uh, communication will have needs to be studied because there is a significant absorption that happens in terahertz uh, frequencies. That has to be, these have to be solved in this particular uh, subtopic. Uh, there are other areas of uh, non OFDM kind of waveforms that can bring in high spectral efficiency. We will have cognitive radio, which is uh, which is an older topic, but then how to do um, spectrum sharing uh, in a more dynamic and fair manner could be a very important topic going forward. And one another topic that we will discuss is on the intelligent reflective surface. So this is in a way um, helping us do away uh, with the channel impairment. So we'll, we'll discuss how an intelligent reflective surface can actually change uh, or help us control the channel to, to, a, to a certain degree that will improve the SNR or reduce the interference. These are some of the key technologies as far as 60 is concerned. Um, and some of it we'll discuss in the future slides. 
In this section of the uh, tutorial, we're going to discuss briefly on um, artificial intelligence and wireless communication. So there are two ways to look at it. One is the application of AI in wireless communication and the second part is what wireless communication needs to do to enable the future um, trends in the AI, right? So uh, that's what we're going to discuss in this section. This is a very uh, interesting slide from Professor Mehdi Benis. Um, this he presented in the first 6G summit. Now, uh, here uh, we need to understand what are the trends in the in the field of AI? So if you look at the classical AI system, right? So we had dumb devices uh, pushing out data, the content into the cloud. The cloud is where the inference training and the inference is happening. And then it gives back uh, the, the response back to the device, right? So here what is gonna happen is um, all the AI is happening in the cloud, right? This is a classical structure. Everything happens in the cloud. Uh, there is a huge amount of data that is being pushed out uh, from each of the end node. Now, there are certain privacy concerns about whether the user wants to send its own data back to the cloud. And of course, this is very uplink centric. I mean, there's a lot of data that needs to be sent out. Um, so this is not uh, apt because there could be delays um, in, in getting the response back from the cloud. And if, of course, it is communication uh, intensive. So that's the classical AI. Now, there's a new concept of the federated AI where uh, part of the um, training and part of the model uh, that is in the neural network can actually be done on the edge, right? So that's where the device, the on-device AI comes into picture, right? So we have certain network side, the cloud is still there, but uh, there is a model parameters and data being transmitted to the cloud. And all of this happens from all of the, all of the devices here, right? And finally, uh, the averaging or the final in uh, training and inference is happening on the cloud. And then the model is given back to the device so that it can apply uh, and do the inference locally. Or of course, there can be inference happening in the cloud as well. So that's the federated AI. Now what is happening here is the bulk of the constraint, the consideration of privacy goes away because uh, the data is never shared in the form that it was done in the classical AI. So that's uh, one way of moving um, in the in the right direction and this is again going to bring down the amount of data that is being transmitted on this uplink and downlink path right so that's uh, that's an improvement of course going forward we'll have a collaborative ai where the cloud will go away and all of this uh, happens virtually uh, the devices collaborate with each other to do what the cloud was doing right so that's the direction now in this this particular paradigm shift right so um, there is a need to uh, do certain transmission over the air. So there is a certain latency consideration, there are certain bandwidth consideration. That's what uh, the wireless has to you know, really solve for the AI. So today, if we talk about 3GPP, the th third generation partnership project, which is looking at this as a study item uh, in its standardization uh, phase, is looking at the federated AI and see how uh, the 5G or the beyond 5G network can really uh, enable a federated AI kind of a system uh, where the uplink latency as well as the, the, the bandwidth uh, is, is really analyzed and those are really enabled in the, in the future network. So that's one of the things that we're going to discuss in the next slide. This brings us to a very interesting topic, uh, which is actually being actively pursued by 3GPP. Um, that is on the AI and machine learning model transfer in Beyond 5G. This is a release 18 study item, and it has uh, three important considerations uh, that is being evaluated, uh, basically to support three types of AI and ML operations in the network. The first one is the uh, AI ML operations splitting between AI ML endpoints. The second one is AI ML model or data distribution and sharing over the network. And the last one is the distributed or the federated learning over the 5G network or beyond 5G network. So the first one, which talks about the splitting between the AI ML endpoints. So we have two endpoints in a very simplistic architecture. We have the end device or the user equipment as what we call in the 3GPP paradigm and the network uh, or the server where is the second AI ML endpoint. 
So uh, typically, if we are able to offload the computation intensive or the energy intensive parts to network endpoints. So for example, if this device wants to do any kind of uh, image recognition, uh, there is there is a certain computation that can happen on the end device and then it's a certain set of computation that can happen on the network node. While uh, if it doesn't need to do anything, it just wants the inference to actually run on the network, it can just capture the image and just transfer it, right? But if it is possible to <coughs> split it and do it in parts, uh, that would really be interesting so that some of the uh, privacy sensitive or delay sensitive parts can be actually done on the end device, right? So there is a lot of uh, issue on actually sharing everything from the device because it has some privacy data. So all of that, if that is already processed on the end device, um, then we can only transmit uh, part of it to the network to carry out the remaining aspect, right? So if we can offload the computation intensive or energy intensive parts to network endpoints and leave the privacy and delay sensitive parts to the end device, that would be a great way to do it, right? Now, device uh, will actually do uh, the model execution to a specific layer and then it will send the intermediate data to the network as it is uh, shown in this picture. So if we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six layers, then uh, it can do till two layers, for example, and then transmit the intermediate data so that the last four can actually happen on the core network. And then the inference, of course, the inference output has to be fed back to the user equipment to actually show what it was, right? So this is uh, the overall procedure that needs to be done uh, in terms of the AI ML operation splitting between the two um, nodes in, the, in a simplistic architecture. This slide uh, captures uh, the, the typical procedure uh, that the user equipment needs to do in order to do a split of a convolution neural network model. And a typical use case could be for image recognition. So for example, if the user on the user equipment side um, presses the need to start recognizing the image, then uh, a need, uh, there needs to be a decision made that what should be the split mode? Should it be at split mode, I mean, at, at the zeroth layer, basically to say that the entire inference is actually run on the network server, or should it be after layer one or layer two or layer three and so on and so forth? So in this particular example, there are six uh, split points. So split point zero is basically when the cloud-based inference is run, this is the split point one, this is the split point two, this is the split point three, this is the split point four, five and six so split point six basically means that everything is happening on the device itself there is no need to do any kind of sharing with the network server so once this determination is done then up to that particular layer the processing has to be done at the user endpoint and the intermediate data has to be transmitted to the next endpoint in the ai ml pipeline which is in this example is the network server and after all the uh, involved endpoints finish the co-inference, the image recognition results are fed back to the user showing the result. And um, if there is a need to adapt this splitting point, then it needs to be redone based on the quality and the response and uh, the, the latency needs, right? So if this particular picture over here shows that if there is, a, there is a image recognition for a tree needs to be done and we have a split point two, then the intermediate data is being pushed to the network server and the final detection happens and then this, this uh, know-how is transmitted back to the end, end user. And over here, it kind of tries to summarize what is the amount of data that needs to be transmitted um, from at each of the split points, right? For example, split point six means that everything is happening at the end device itself. So there is absolutely no need to in, transmit any data. So this kind of table uh, tells that for each and every split point, what is the uplink data rate need to for for the use for the user equipment to actually push it push it out to the core network. So this would give us, uh, depending on the scenario and depending on the uh, current congestion in the network, a decision can also be made to move the split point appropriately, uh, assuming that the end device has enough computation power to do the specified number of. 
right so that's uh, one method that is being actively discussed in the 3gpp um, uh, forum so that brings us to the second part or the second important consideration of the ai ml operation which is the model or data distribution sharing over the network so uh, typically uh, for any end node to do uh, any kind of inference uh, a model is to be preloaded right now due to the uh, due to the computation or due to the memory constraints it's not advisable to keep all the models um, you know, downloaded on the user equipment so an online model distribution uh, is needed in which the ai ml model can be distributed from the network endpoint to the devices when they need um, to adopt uh, to adapt a changed uh, task. So for example, there could be a change in environment and there could be a change in need uh, or to perform certain um, AI ML tasks. So depending on the need uh, and the environment, an appropriate model can be downloaded from uh, all the available models uh, in, the, in the network. So for this purpose, uh, the UE needs has to be monitored constantly. Right? So that's one of the important things. And uh, of course, uh, the AI model downloading is equally is, is a very important aspect because there are so many features and the amount of data that a model requires also changes dynamically. So what to use when and when to download which model is a very important consideration. So depending on the uh, input image or the environment or the, or the background lighting condition, and how much precision is required. A different model yields a different uh, inference time as well as a different quality of output. So this, this figure kind of illustrates that, right? So image one is, is best uh, output is from mobile net, for example, but image two uh, would, would, would require a inception kind of a model to actually really detect it nicely. Right. So uh, if we were to do that, and if, uh, if we actually download the appropriate model depending on uh, the kind of scenario or kind of input image, then uh, there is a need to dynamically download it. And then there is a need and there is a requirement that is pushed onto the wireless network to have that kind of download, uh, no bit, bit per second support. For example, if you look at ResNet 152, right? It requires up to 1.9 Gbps. Uh, of, of download speed so that we can download the model fast and do the uh, inference uh, in the required um, response time for the user. Of course, we can always use a static model, which will work in most cases, but adopting or adapting the model to a different working condition will improve the condition accuracy and better user experience. So that's uh, why a dynamic download is so important and that poses a new set of requirements to the wireless network and that that is what is being actively pursued and how do we do this how is the method of exchange of information so that the right model is downloaded depending on the current wireless scenario as well as the current image uh, um, uh, under which it is being taken so that is being uh, one of the important areas of consideration the next consideration um, by the uh, in the in the beyond 5G uh, network is how to handle the distributed federated learning. So in a distributed federated learning, there are a set of user equipments who are taking part in the federation. Uh, I mean, they are actually part. There are federated UEs which help in the learning process. So the cloud server trains a global model by aggregating the local models partially trained by each of the end device. Now within each training iteration, the UE would perform training based on its own local data, but the model is downloaded from the uh, FL server or the federated learning server. And once the training is completed, the UE would report back the interim training results, which are basically in a way helping um, update the gradients in the global model. And once that is done, in the next uh, training iteration, uh, the, the updated model is again downloaded. Uh, so that the local training can happen. So in this way, the, the model is, is better trained and it helps update the global model and make it uh, better uh, in, this, in this process. So this slide captures the entire federated learning process over the 5G system in the form of a federated learning protocol. Now in this entire system, 
there are a set of federation uh, there is a set of federated ues which take part in the federated learning process and the federated learning um, training server has to pick devices now we are showing two uh, iterations no the nth training iteration and the n plus 1 -th training iteration so there are certain set of processes that happen in the uh, nth training iteration and the cer certain other processes that happen in the n plus 1 -th training iteration so what will happen is uh, the users will first report on their training resources and the federated learning server's job is to select the devices which will take part in the nth training iteration now how can it do that so it looks at the ue geographic location and decides okay these are the three set of ues which can actually help me update my global model so once that is done the global model is downloaded onto the three user equipments and using the local data the training uh, begins the training happens and is completed on each and every device in its own timeline and once that is done the training results are reported back to the federated uh, learning server and then aggregation happens and the gradients are updated and now in the next iteration this updated model can be downloaded by another set of ues which again is selected by the federated learning server using a similar process so in this next iteration as shown in this diagram there are different set of ues that are selected so it not necessarily mean that in the, if in the older in the earlier iteration a set of ues were selected the next iteration will have the same set of ues so that is actually also improving uh, the the uh, the global model by selecting diverse set of user user equipments so once so this is the entire process of the federated learning and this is how the 5g system has to uh, you know take care of this entire latency as well as the bandwidth um, to to support this kind of a system we as researchers are always uh, you know um, looking forward to find the open challenges so right now this this entire topic is being studied and with the wireless and ai co-working what kind of uh, things that needs to be really solved in the standard at least right because this entire process has to be standardized now there is a there is a need if you look at the ai ml split uh, the dynamic selection of the split point and the reporting on the split point considering the wireless channel is a very important topic that needs to be you no know, discussed and there has to be processes and procedures that needs to be uh, you know uh, standardized so that's an important area or an important challenge on how to do it and uh, if you look at uh, downloading of appropriate model so how to consider tasks how to find out right environment and the wireless channel and how do we dynamically select which is the right model to be downloaded and how do we report that this is the appropriate model to the network to actually you know help download so that's another important uh, open challenge and the entire system has to be built now similarly if you look at the federated ues we talked about the selection of ues now now and there has to be certain reliability in the in the in the in the in the reporting process because it's a it's the federated learning uh, we should have improved reliability on the wireless channel so that the uh, updation of global model happens without any failure with the uh, with the wireless environment things keep on changing so how do we dynamically uh, adapt to that and ensure that the communication happens in low latency and uh, improved reliability is an important uh, task and of course if you look at all of the three of them it is fairly possible that all the use case scenarios can coexist on a user equipment so one job or one task may need splitting the other needs a model download and maybe it's on, it's on happening on a federated ue so this entire coexistence is uh, brings in more challenges and how do we solve that is one another area that is of uh, no immense interest to the community that brings us to the next section of this uh, tutorial on aerial communication or the non terrestrial networks so here we will primarily try to understand um, why a non terrestrial network augmentation is so important in the future networks and what advantages it can bring in and then we will look at specifically at low altitude platforms and see uh, what kind of challenges are there what kind of benefits are there and what kind of solutions exists for the same we begin with um, understanding the mega trends uh, on connectivity and capacity so like we discussed in the past right i mean there is a surge of both the number of devices as well as uh, the use case of moving towards video 
Now, uh, typically our cellular systems are designed to support voice and data, right? But uh, with the advent of social, financial, and more immersive use cases, of course, this is going to go up. And we also discussed how a user is in turn becoming a content generator as well with the uh, with the growth of social media. And uh, this, this slide over here tries to uh, capture that uh, there is a gap between the demand and um, and the supply in terms of how much bandwidth we can give versus how much bandwidth demand is there, right? And what we have also understood um, through the research is available that demand is not homogeneous. It changes during the time of the day and location in a cell. So for example, if you are, uh, I mean, of course, in the pre-COVID area, when everybody is moving from their residence to the office, there is a surge of traffic during the uh, morning hours and similarly when they return back to the home in the evening hours. So we, we, sell, we uh, quite often find that there is not enough capacity. It's hard to know, uh, do any kind of transactions. Uh, the network becomes clogged and so on and so forth. But if you do the same thing on a weekend because there's a lack of less traffic, uh, there is no problem with the capacity. Now that's one, uh, one problem that needs to be addressed. Again, this is another uh, depiction of the same problem, which says that user density for a location may be dynamic, but cell densities for the location largely is remain static. So in this picture, it kind of tries to show the heat map of Amsterdam region in terms of the coverage. And we can see there are certain holes, primarily because there are not enough users. And what do we do when there suddenly there is a surge of a user and there's an event in that location? Uh, do we go about deploying? Uh, cellular uh, like the macro or the terrestrial system or can we do something more or something intelligent to really augment or the sudden surge of traffic uh, the data traffic requirement in that area so that's uh, where aerial communication or on-demand network um, is kind of uh, going to solve so we'll see in the few, in the subsequent slides how if we go the terrestrial network way of enhancing the coverage or capacity Either a small cell, a macro base station, a relay, relay node, or a distributed antenna system has to be deployed, which takes time and it is capital intensive. So the other solution uh, to do that uh, would be to deploy an aerial platform. So basically uh, what we do is uh, we bring in a base station mounted on an unmanned aerial vehicle and uh, deploy it in the region where you need coverage. For example, in the first part of the figure, you see that uh, the base station is overloaded. Now, in, in an overloaded case, uh, maybe there is not enough capacity that can be offered to all the users. So a flying base station comes in, which is connected to the backhaul, the uh, gateway and the core network wirelessly. It will come and uh, start augmenting the terrestrial network or basically offload some of the user equipments to the aerial cell. Right. So that's uh, one scenario. The other scenario is when there is a malfunctioned uh, base station, maybe there is a there is a loss of backhaul, as in maybe there is the fiber has gone bad or there is loss of power. Uh, what do we do? We can bring in another aerial base station and try to serve the users on ground. So that's another case. Um, in certain other use cases, uh, for example, here there is a typical war war scene where there are soldiers on the other side of the foothill and they need to be offered some sort of a communication link and uh, they can be you know uh, the same thing can be done through an aerial network here as it is relayed back to the uh, base station here now uh, other scenarios in the internet of things paradigm uh, there could be remote nodes in uh, remote locations which don't need coverage all the time but uh, there are certain data that needs to be sensor data that needs to be you know brought back to the core network so a aerial base station can go and take it um, and come back, right? So that's uh, these kind of use cases can be enabled from uh, the aerial communication. So there is a capacity enhancement as well as coverage enhancement happening. Now, when we talk about ultra I mean, UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, there are different kind of platforms, right? So there are different classifications. So one is on the type, which is like a fixed wing uh, UAV, which is pr pretty much like a small aircraft. It cannot hover. It moves at a high speed and uh, it can carry a substantial amount of payload and it can also fly for several hours because it can use the, I mean, it can harness uh, the, the, the flying capabilities like an aircraft. Uh, it can glide as well. 
Uh, the other is the rotary wing, which is like a drone. So like the, these are like small helicopters which can hover uh, in, a, in a region. Uh, they can move at lower speed and um, they, they have fixed wing. Uh, the only problem is since this is too much of mechanical movement and they're battery powered, they don't have a very great flight time, maybe uh, under an hour or a little over an hour. So th these are the two kinds uh, which are classified on the type of the wing. The other way in, of classification is at what altitude is it flying? Is it flying right? So one is the low altitude platform, which is primarily uh, flying up to one kilometer height, and it is very fast and flexible in deployment. It uh, offers quick mobility, cost effective, and it can um, fly for in, some hours and pretty much like a drone. So these low altitude platforms uh, are pretty much a rotary wing kind. Uh, which we also known as drones. Uh, the other is the high altitude platform, which are basically quasi static in nature. Uh, and uh, these are like bigger uh, balloon kind of uh, equipments, which are above 17 kilometer height. They are long endurance. They can run for days and months because they don't need uh, a lot of power to fly. But of course, and they can harness solar energy to really power the base stations from there. So that kind of gives a wider coverage um, and uh, one of the ways to enhance the uh, coverage in remote locations. So these are the ways in which the classification of UAV happens. So our focus would be on low altitude platform going forward in the discussion and pretty much a drone uh, which can hover for a shorter duration of time and serve the users on ground. And we'll see how it is required and uh, what are these, what are the challenges in, challenges in that deployment and how to solve that. Before we go ahead and discuss more on the low altitude platform, I just wanted to bring uh, some context on how the 3GPP is treating uh, the aerial network or the non-terrestrial network. So uh, first of all, um, in 3GPP, they are looking at all different altitudes where an aerial platform can be deployed, right from satellite, uh, high altitude, to uh, uh, low altitude platforms, right? So uh, on, on the one of the work items, which is on the studying the channel model of non-terrestrial network, the impetus is on satellite and high altitude platform. So uh, they have, they're treating different altitudes in this manner. So a geostationary uh, satellite uh, is uh, assumed to be in the altitude range of 200 to 1000 kilometer above the Earth's surface. The non-geostationary uh, or medium Earth orbit or low Earth orbit uh, is between 100 and 500 kilometer. Uh, within the aerial platform, uh, they consider the high altitude platform uh, between 20 and 50 kilometer, medium altitude platform between 3 and 10 kilometer, and low altitude platform up to 1 kilometer. And today, uh, uh, the channel model is being studied uh, for uh, satellite and HAPS. Right. And the benefit, uh, what they understood and they understand uh, is pretty much similar in line, like it will provide a very large coverage area. So primarily for coverage uh, improvement uh, in also adding remote connectivity to rural areas and uh, demand based coverage and capacity enhancement. And of course, one of the important aspect uh, that we've not discussed so far is uh, the availability of line of sight link between the uh, aerial aerial base station and the ground user so assuming a car moving on a highway uh, it would mostly see a line of sight link uh, with the with the aerial platform above and that brings in a lot of benefits unlike the terrestrial network where a non light of line of sight is one of the main um, you know links uh, to serve the user and of course both have their own benefits but just to say that line of sight is a very very important and strong uh, between the uh, aerial base station and the ground user. On the um, UAV or the low altitude platform, there are two uh, other technical specification that is being um, you know, uh, considered in 3GPP. The first one, which not only treats the uh, uh, UAV based base station, but all the other use cases are also there like a, like a flying uh, UE. Uh, so those kind of use cases for surveillance for uh, deliveries are also being discussed. And uh, there is a there is a study item on enhancement of un, uh, unmanned aerial vehicle. So both uh, in terms of uh, UAS support in 3GPP, the unmanned aerial system, and this unmanned aerial system could either be a base station 
or a surveillance UE or a delivery UE. There are also enhancement in terms of how uh, it can augment commercial and government sector. So both of these specifications are actively uh, you know, uh, being discussed in 3GPP in release 18. And here, over here, the, the base station use case is pretty much described. So we have the uh, UAVs uh, carrying flying base stations and they are connected wirelessly to the 5G core network on the backhaul. So uh, the user equipment can talk to aerial base station uh, directly. Similarly, there is another use case, which is the UXNB acts as a relay. So between the user and the terrestrial uh, base station, the UAV acts as a relay. So this is another deployment uh, that is being discussed. And uh, the, the terrestrial network by virtue of the earlier design is connected back to the 5G core network. So these two deployments are being actively pursued in 3GPP as far as UAV or drone based uh, low altitude platform is considered. So on the low altitude platform, um, we studied a few uh, research papers uh, from recent publication. So this one is one of the most cited um, low altitude platform paper, which talks about how to fix the altitude for a low altitude platform. Like at what height should it fly so that the coverage is maximized. So over here, the channel is analyzed, which is partly uh, free space uh, propagation and partly uh, within a relay distributed uh, urban scenario, uh, there is a certain amount of uh, degradation due to this kind of uh, environment. So uh, the combination of these two actually helps uh, find out what is the right height for the LAP, uh, for the lap to actually serve the ground users. And over here, the contribution is to give uh, altitude um, as a function of path loss and other statistical parameters of the urban environment. Uh, however, uh, if you go and look at the small scale fading part was not really considered well in the paper and uh, uh, the uh, it is only about coverage extension it's a co coverage coverage enhancement or coverage uh, analysis there is no capacity analysis that is done uh, and one of the most important thing is a single uav is considered in this paper multiple uavs will bring in another challenge and that is discussed in the next paper as i will, will talk about so uh, in the extension of the previous work in this work uh, there is a deployment of multiple uavs for optimal wireless coverage and they analyzed in a very similar fashion uh, and the downlink coverage was given as a function of UAV altitude and um, the important aspect of circle packing uh, algorithm was used to really come up with how many number of UAVs will actually give the optimal coverage and at what height for each of them. So that's uh, a, a marginal improvement from, uh, from the earlier paper. Uh, however, it is again based on coverage analysis and capacity is not really studied and per user sum rate or per user throughput is not really analyzed in this paper. So in this work, uh, which is one another reference that we uh, uh, had in our study, uh, there is a resource allocation study for solar powered UV communication. So it becomes a joint optimization of fixing the altitude of the UAV in such a manner that it can harness enough solar power and offer great capacity to the users. Um, however, uh, while they have um, looked at the capacity increase for the user at a system level, they have not looked at per user uh, throughput maximization. And uh, of course, it is a little uh, complex. Uh, they used a successive convex approximation because they were trying to do a joint optimization of two constraints simultaneously. So um, that's another work that we referred in building our uh, system. And in the next few slides, I'll discuss uh, specifically what problem we tried to solve and the results around it. Before we go and discuss our uh, work, which is on capacity enhancement, there's another very uh, interesting paper on um, how to do UAV deployment for Internet of Things uh, kind of a scenario. So here um, the UAVs are moving aggregators or base stations for IoT network and the challenge that was being solved was the optimal deployment uh, with mobility and energy efficient use of UAVs and minimization of transmit power for the IoT nodes. So all the IoT nodes are power, uh, no, um, they, they're not really power hungry but they're power deficient and how to minimize the power consumption of each IoT node is a very important aspect. And in addition to that, there are UAVs moving and there needs to be certain association that needs to be done between the UAV and the IoT nodes. 
So they again do a joint optimization of the deployment and mobility of UVs and its device association um, and try to bring in uh, the deployment uh, design uh, in, this, in this system. However, uh, in this deployment, the IoT nodes are assumed static and not mobile. And the bit rate for the IoT is not really um, taken into consideration. So the IoT traffic also requires uh, some form of guaranteed bit rate. So that uh, if we bring in that, that will become another additional challenge that can be solved in somebody if you wants to you know, really uh, make it uh, viable and usable in the real deployment. In summary, uh, what we found is uh, lab-based drone cells are um, can be deployed under different constraints and it the, it um, brings in different results. So if it is for capacity, there has to be a different kind of a deployment. If it's for coverage, it is different. If it's for Internet of Things, it has to be uh, different. Uh, in our uh, analysis, what we found, a uh, very important aspect of the user experience is uh, not uh, available, as in what is the user's need? That also is equally important. And that is one important area that needs to be considered. And in the in the next few slides, I'll discuss on how we touch upon that. Now, there are other problems also, like uh, labs are power hungry, so the hover time, the hover time is another constraint which is treated by some. But then, uh, how do we work around this hover, hover time? Is there a way to really uh, remove this constraint? That would be really interesting. So uh, right now there is no solution for that, but that would be an area uh, which can be looked at. And uh, labs are also enabled for latency reduction because they are really close to the user and there's a line of sight uh, link. Now, this is again, which is not treated very well in existing literature. So this could be another direction of you no know, uh, doing aerial network analysis. So before we get into uh, uh, describing our work, uh, I think there are certain um, definitions that needs to be you know clarified. So first of all, we need to understand uh, what does the coverage um, and what does uh, positioning of a drone cell mean. So here, if you see the drone cell is shown to be moving around uh, the 3D grid, right? So for every location, there is a different coverage on ground, right? So uh, if, the, if the drone is at this location, it can serve uh, the area under the gray cell. If it were at the one extreme edge of this vertex, uh, on, on this on this cuboid, you can see that the coverage which is shown by dotted line changes, right? So effectively, if you see, uh, if we assume that this is the terrestrial coverage, right, which is kind of fixed, that possible aerial coverage can move depending on where the aerial cell is actually deployed in the 3D uh, system. So that's one. The second thing is there are two modes of deployment, right? One is uh, called standalone, in which uh, the uh, the drone cell uh, serves the uh, user directly. Now this could be looked at as a relay or a standalone uh, drone cell getting connected to the core network back, right? So that's one uh, method of deployment. The second method is called augmented, where uh, like a carrier aggregation or a dual connectivity, there are two connections with the for the user. One is through the aerial cell back to the core network, and one is directly to the terrestrial cell. So this augmented deployment is what uh, is very interesting uh, topic because it can uh, it can actually augment the capacity uh, currently being offered by the terrestrial cell very well. So that's uh, what uh, we wanted to cover before we move into the discussion uh, in the next few slides. In this section, uh, I will discuss uh, a very important problem of optimal positioning and doing the trajectory for a low altitude platform. But the difference is we're gonna use feedback, the user feedback. Because we discussed that the user uh, experience and the user requirement is very essential. So we'll discuss how we do that. So in this work, we propose a novel feedback going from the user equipment to the terrestrial network, which we define as the feedback for aerial cell trajectory uh, or fact. Now this uh, fact is a set of parameters that are being shared from the user equipment to the uh, network. Now, what are these parameters? First one is the prediction or the forecast of the data buffer uh, in the uplink and downlink that the user may be expecting or generating in the next time slot or we call as the aerial scheduling period. Aerial scheduling period is basically the period for which a drone cell stays in a location. 
now it could be a few uh, i mean it could be hard some minutes it could be a few hours depending on how you have deployed in the system now for the next asp uh, what is the predicted uplink and downlink buffer for a user equipment that is uh, that is to be fed back the second is the traffic type whether it is a uplink centric or a downlink centric traffic that is fed back third one is the probability of staying in the same zone or in the same region for the next time slot so uh, this is again based on the estimation if the ue will remain static or whether it will move uh, from the current location because uh, as we know a drone can only serve a smaller subset of the uh, terrestrial area it is it is essential that uh, if the user is selected he is actually staying in the same area because the drone will actually move to a very close location from which it can serve that particular user and the last very important factor is the channel quality with the terrestrial cell so what it essentially means is if the channel quality with the terrestrial cell is good then the user should be served by the terrestrial cell itself but if the channel quality is worsened then there is a need for it to really be served by the uh, by the drone cell so these four parameters together form a reason for a user selection so how does how does it do intuitively we can understand it as if the predicted buffer is very high in the future the prioritized traffic type is towards a uh, towards one of the uh, towards downlink and then uh, there is a probability of staying in the same zone uh, for the next or basically the user is highly probable to be static and it has a bad channel quality with the terrestrial cell then there is a higher probability that the drone cell is going to select that user to be served through the drone cell so that's very critical and so far this is one of one one only work that actually does this something like this now this will take care of the user requirement it will take care of the terrestrial channel quality as well as will take care that the user is uh, whether mobile or not mobile so depending on that the decision is taken about the drone's position so what we did is we went ahead we modeled this entire system we ran through simulations and we'll show the results in the next slide on the results first we show the accuracy of our neural network model on data prediction so we showed that using lstm uh, we had a very low error we were actually 87% um, accurate or say less to say that there was very low error in data traffic prediction at at the user using lstm that was one and using the feedback we could show that uh, once the uh, drone moves to a particular location which is uh, rightly selected for the users which are more uh, resource constrained in terms of bad channel as well as they have higher data to be sent we show that there is about 41st 44% improvement in the drone usage itself right so these are the two important results from this entire uh, simulation around this idea so that was uh, that is uh, how uh, we showed that our work was better than some of the available literature on uh, optimal uh, drone positioning uh, in the in the, in the current um, sphere of things yeah. so that brings us to a one very interesting enabler uh, that will definitely uh, be very uh, it's a little futuristic but it's very interesting because the kind of advantages that it can bring in the system to enhance the capacity and coverage are huge uh, it goes by name intelligent surfaces or reconfigurable in um, intelligent surfaces or intelligent reflective surfaces so we'll talk about uh, the concept behind uh, ris or irs and we'll also look at some of the improvement and gains that it can bring in uh, being used as a transmitter or as a reflecting beam former beam former right irs or ris or software controlled meta surfaces these are the different names by which this technology is known um, so typically if we look at uh, wireless communication and physical air technologies these are generally capable for adapting to the space and time varying wireless environment so largely to say that uh, depending on the channel uh, we can adapt uh, different uh, schemes like we can do beam forming we can do power control we can do adaptive modulation and um, uh, so this is primarily these are the mechanisms to adapt to the channel but we don't have any control over it so uh, if there is a method to control this environment 
then that would bring in a new degree of freedom, right? So a software controlled reflection uh, using IRS as planar surface uh, is used and is deployed in the environment. It comprises of a large number of low cost passive reflective elements as, as visible in this, this particular um, image here, right? So these are the reflective elements uh, which are used in the environment. And if you are able to use it, then we can induce some form of, of an amplitude and phase change to the incident signal uh, independently. And therefore, uh, they can collaboratively achieve a fine grained 3D or three dimensional reflect beam forming towards the object, uh, towards the uh, receiver, right? So using this, we can actually in a way change the channel itself. So that's a new technology that's uh, gonna come uh, in the next next decade and it provides a new degree of freedom as we discussed and it enhances the desired signal power at the receiver or sometimes it can also be used to destructively cancel the undesired signal such as the co-channel interference so uh, this is uh, this is the entire technique behind irs and if if you look at irs this eliminates the use of transmit uh, rf chain so this is not really an active uh, no amplitude forward kind of a thing. It just reflects what is gonna, going to come on it and whatever is incident. And it operates in a very short range. It can be densely deployed uh, and it is scalable uh, as far as cost and low energy consumption is concerned. And without, there is no need for sophisticated inter, um, interference management among these, pa uh, these passive irises. So that's overall uh, the uh, the entire idea behind IRS and in the coming slides we'll see we'll look at a mathematical model to understand how it brings in the benefit in the system. So before we go uh, and look at the math mathematical model of uh, uh, using uh, RIS, uh, this is a little bit more on the RIS in terms of what does it actually uh, comprise of and how different it is from existing technologies, right? So uh, if you look at um, RIS, uh, these are nearly passive. Um, ideally, they do not need any dedicated energy source except for since we are talking about uh, reconfigurability, there needs to be a controller and we'll need uh, a certain method to you know, make sure that we can uh, alter the phase and um, uh, the, the the properties of these RIS elements so that we can um, either uh, we know where to focus and which which angle should the incident rays actually be you know going out to so that's a little bit of power required but in general for the RIS itself there is no need for an, uh, for any um, energy source and um, they can be viewed as contiguous surfaces and ideally uh, at any point uh, we can shape the wave which is coming in uh, using the soft programming like we discussed using a controller and as uh, this is these are not powered so there is no uh, ADC or DAC is used and they're not affected by the receiver noise um, since there are no power amplifiers they do not amplify or they not uh, they do not introduce any noise uh, when reflecting the signal and this in a way uh, inherently provides for a full duplex transmission uh, so they have a full band response and ideally they can work in any operating frequency. They can be easily deployed, uh, for example, on the facades of uh, buildings and ceilings on factories, indoor spaces, um, as well as on human clothing. So that's uh, the kind of uh, you know, different different deployment that we'll see in the in the years to come. So um, here uh, on this is this is one image which kind of tries to differentiate. So if you look at a typical metal plate, we cannot actually control uh, the you know, the angle of arrival and the angle of departure. But if this is an ideal metal surface, uh, we can actually it's very generalized and we can we can it's a very smooth in terms of its gradient of phases, right? So that's what this ideal metal surface uh, is showing. But in reality, uh, we'll have practical metal surfaces would be uh, this would be uh, discretized. I mean, it won't be contiguous. But still, uh, we'll we'll be able to you know get to the gains, and we'll discuss in the coming slides. So largely, if you look at how uh, the entire communication is evolving, the physical layer communication is evolving. So from moving from sensing the channel to uh, you know uh, adapting the signal to uh, to the channel. Now we are moving towards a smart radio environment, and in a way, we are trying to control the channel itself. So that's the uh, evolution um, uh, in, in this.
with the next few slides we'll uh, compare uh, using a two ray model uh, what the benefit of a ris uh, would be in the system so this is uh, typically a two ray model we have a transmitter at height ht and a receiver at height um, hr uh, at distance d apart and um, there are there are two paths so um, typically in wireless communication we talk about multi multi paths so one is a direct line of sight path which is l distance apart and uh, the second path in this um, this this uh, description is reflected via the ground and uh, it travels the uh, distance r1 and then goes reflected path is r2 so if we look at the phase differences uh, for these two paths uh, the phase difference is largely 2 pi r1 plus r2 minus l upon lambda and if we look at a very large distance uh, when the two uh, transmitter and receiver are very large uh, spaced and typically d is similar to l which is similar to r1 plus r2 we can uh, we can we can come to a um, uh, uh, simplification of this particular uh, description here and we can know that the uh, that the receive power uh, due to the distance uh, due to the fading in the distance uh, and due to the reflected path would be inversely proportional to the fourth order of the distance so that's when you have one reflected path so we can see that the moment there is a reflected path the entire power degrades significantly if there was no reflected path then the second term would go away in this description and it would be inversely proportional only to the distance uh, inversely proportional to the distance square so if the ground reflection is not present we uh, we have much better chance of getting a higher power receive power but if there is a ground reflection present and uh, using the approximation of our reflective index of uh, you know the surface at around minus one we know that the, there is significant degradation because there is a destructive interference in a way uh, due to the phase differences of the two paths that its a signal gets uh, further deteriorated and we'll see that using the same uh, simple uh, description of the two ray model how uh, ris can bring in the benefit and what is the benefit of keeping one contiguous surface versus uh, n n element irs in the coming slide in this slide uh, we try to compare the two ray model uh, in the presence of an ris so in the first figure as you can see uh, on the ground uh, where the reflection was happening in the previous uh, system model uh, there is one irs that is kept right now with irs uh, the entire idea is that the phase and amplitude can be controlled of the incident ray right so uh, on, in the in the same equation uh, that was there uh, the the r uh, which is the reflective index can be adjusted in a manner that the phase is controlled and then the phase is becomes e raised to j uh, delta phi and with large l um, uh, with large d um, this this entire since the phase is controlled we can constructively uh, make it uh, make, make the two signals collaborate at the receiver uh, point of view uh, and then uh, it actually ends up uh, being like a line of sight um, kind of an equation where uh, the the dk uh, or the or the signal power received uh, at the receiver is inversely proportional to the distance squared so that's uh, with one ris now when we do a array of ris right so if we have n n, uh, n reflective uh, materials right so for each and every uh, ris there is an independent channel that is seen right so for every ij um, ris the same equation has to be uh, re uh, evaluated and then there would be a sigma term for all the n reflective uh, uh, components right reflecting components and we'll see that it will reduce uh, in a very similar manner but there is a factor of n plus 1 squared by which the receive power gets multiplied so we can say that uh, first it would be um, inversely proportional to distance squared and also okay. hey uh, Dushar, it was an um, you know wonderful experience right and specifically uh, i've been uh, came across the or the user experience of evolution of the communication right way back then we place a trunk call we sit near to the phone uh, waiting for the you know std calls to connect it 
then like you know um, we had a large cell phone right then back to um, having a you know, video chat now metaverse so as uh, pat used to say technology is a magic so as an user experience that i would like to hear from you what is that the 6g is going to give an a future user experience is and what are the applications that it is going to enable with so uh, some of that we discussed in the session uh, so primarily uh, if we see the uh, era and how we have progressed from having one single device to having multiple devices um, i think going forward one important thing is um, that we can experience surfaces and um, uh, that is going to completely change the user experience you'll not probably be limited to you no know, devices but yeah you can interact with the environment and maybe communicate and uh, fetch your needs and in order to do that i mean it requires uh, a lot of enabling technologies right from you no know, designing material new and new kind of materials to the wireless technology that we looked at and of course the use cases of uh, virtual reality augmented reality and immersive uh, multimedia are going to be you know uh, the, uh, the the way forward and the ai and ml and all the technology components are going to you know be the fabric underneath thank you thank you so um i have a question wherein that yeah. you know how does using a mobile uavs in coordination for providing the aerial connectivity work wouldn't it lead to uh, no signal at some locations while uavs are in transit right and if we ensure we cover the same areas at all the times then what advantage that we get from mobility of the uavs okay so uh, if you look at uh, aerial network uh, there are different different scenarios under which is going to be used right but if you look at coverage extension we need it at remote locations and in those remote locations we will probably not use uavs but we will use something like a high, high altitude platform or a satellite communicate now uh, the the concept of uavs are more uh, uh, applicable in uh, some sort of a capacity augmentation for example you have a terrestrial network and there are certain hot spots where there is a lower coverage or there are certain regions where there is an event going to happen so you need a on demand network now now for mm-hmm. that on demand network it's very difficult to build up uh, ground up a new macro base station or do relay nodes or do uh, you know distributed antenna systems so in those kind of systems uh, uavs are going to be useful and the question that is posed is using mobile uavs uh, we may have uh, i mean it's difficult for it to move around and cover of course it's a very mm-hmm. complex Hmm. kind of a beam form system right. and this is a challenge and it needs hmm. to be solved there are solutions in the literature but we need to work up i mean uh, make sure that it is uh, it is coming up to the standards and actually really deployable in the field so there are challenges of course challenges. Yeah, technology yeah. Uh, and the benefits are humongous so right that's one thing and so, um, yeah yeah so the, the next question sub- was question. yeah the uh, next sub question qu- of that is uh, also like you know because in 5g the one of the critical challenge for us is like you know the, uh, the attenuation or signal pen- penetration right we kind of right. somehow overcome it right so right. what are the hindrances in 6g and as well as the research challenges that you kind of see i want to take this as a sub question so that the research community uh, would probably like you know start looking into those yeah yeah okay so when we when we talk about 5g millimeter wave we already know uh, there is a lot of uh, attenuation that is possible and we need i mean that's where the beam forming system comes right. in right? right because that gives us a range but of course uh, you will have beam beam failures and beam recovery that's a very important problem and today also we are struggling uh, really to manage uh, the beams well and that's a very open problem i mean it's mm-hmm. all about receiver optimization it's not really a standardization thing. it's not standardized Send how out. somebody does beam tracking and beam recovery this mm-hmm. is something left to implementations and that's where uh, we need to improve the solution now in the in the era of 60 uh, we will move to a higher uh, order terahertz uh, band right so that brings in a new spectrum the spectrum itself brings in new challenges that innovation is even higher and the entire beam former and low cost beam mm-hmm. forming and the beam recovery and beam beam tracking are the kind of problems that could even be there so of course uh, that's a very interesting area to really work on so that is one but in general uh, we will also have different kind of deployments in the network right we talked about aerial communication we are talking about intelligent reflective surfaces which is kind of change you are we are getting a control to change the channel right so that and if we couple it with terahertz communication and millimeter wave and we also have to support legacy it brings in a very very complicated kind of architecture so all of that to really be realizable 
there are challenges and all of that are open uh, open open problems yeah yeah good so um you know uh, the follow up question is on the security per se i think yeah the security is the most important topic why the hd devices are getting so popular right but per se on the 5g and the 6g protocol itself does it have a native capability of enhancing the security or it's something to do with an um, you know end devices or yeah Yeah. So even though I'm not a very, I'm not an expert in this area. Uh, in general, uh, there is improved uh, robust encryption in 5G, but mm-hmm. that that is one part of it, where the encryption and the and the uh, IDs are secured. But that's not all. I mean, if, even if you look at things like virtualization, right? So the hardware is not uh, a, a, like a like a uh, dedicated hardware. You can virtual uh, virtualize and make networks out okay. of the existing infra. so if there is any attack that is happen if there is any possibility of a compromise recovery is very quick because it's yeah. a virtualized uh, environment right so that mm-hmm. itself enables a uh, faster adaptation and ensuring that security uh, issues are really fixed fast that is one now um, there is also uh, we talk about edge computing right mm-hmm. so a lot of critical information processing can happen in the edge so mm-hmm. even though there are portions in the network which may be attacked and there are compromises possible the critical information may not get compromised Stay because it. Mm. it stays mm. on the edge right mm. those kind mm. of things uh, augment uh, if augment. not if you don't say strengthening security but it gives us uh, no better uh, resilience to the attack right? okay got it got it so now moving to uh, on the architecture side of things i think uh, the recent past days i mean specifically on the 5g when it comes uh, on the deployment phase the software defined ran functionality is getting more important and specifically like again aml right coming into picture moving right. towards this collaborative and federative right. era what is that soc architecture when they just dis- design and uh, the chip design it's a, it's a okay. fundamental component that they have to do a basic left shift thinking or radical thinking out of i mean which is out of the box um, you know okay. architecture okay so i i don't really work on the soc architecture okay. but i can definitely imagine uh, the the kind of uh, questions on whether it should be left shift or we have to have a radical uh, thinking if you just look at uh, i mean there are certain parts that i would like to answer first so in terms of the software defined ram Uh, this is more about the virtualization and the uh, net- network slicing coming into. So I think this would, um, I mean, this would really be seen in next five to seven years how it is realized. And of course, six G would really be built on uh, the five G infrastructure. Mm. This automatically comes in. Now, in terms of the AI and ML, uh, we discussed a few of the things that uh, some of it was captured in the session. Like mm. it is applicable in different different network nodes. If you look at the user equipment itself. it can do uh, ai ml for beam management and radio link failure prevention right if you look at the ram the radio i mean the uh, the radio access it can help uh, it to do better beam management or even do traffic estimation and ensure that the scheduling for the resources is happening better right so that's another uh, area where ai ml is applicable and if you look at the core network uh, you can do better self organization and self healing or what you call that self optimizing network can happen Uh, better with more more learning uh, in the network like when it has to happen how does it take a call that it has to optimize so those things are going to you know come the ai ml is one of the key pieces that we're going to see in the future network. and if you look at the soc architecture one important thing that we are going to see soon is the npu or the, uh, the neural processing or the ai ml uh, models for the modem use cases or the mm. or the uh, user equipment use cases has to happen within the soc of modem right mm. so that would require us to you know so the, the 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 die size would probably go up right mm. now how do we optimally pack it it could be left shift or we need mm. a radical thinking that is pretty much on the baseband architecture but if mm. you look at the terahertz transmitter that itself is a completely new area and mm. uh, today we are looking at beam formers we are looking at the transmitters and the rfic is de- designed for terahertz communication those would probably need some sort of a radical thinking to really you know make them uh, really small and uh, of course terahertz enables uh, beam forming because yeah. the uh, the lambda is smaller so you can pack more antennas but yeah. all of that has to you know be thought of in terms of ssr yeah yeah so and i just sense a question of this is like when we just take about an 5g network per se we talk about and throughput the latencies the data volumes of it right. whereas in the ai like when it probably on the image point of it it could be resnet yolo 
or rnns right and mini go so it these are two different worlds in terms of right. uh, we how do we evaluate uh, you know the performance of an um, you know uh, an soc or a network together right when you get into a next generation collaborative um, era or an federated era what do you think that this benchmark bench uh, benchmarking or the new workloads is going to look like right and uh, could you please give a little bit of a sneak peek to that Yeah, so we talked about uh, multimedia, right? So multimedia is one of the main drivers. Like in fourth generation, we found internet was the killer app, right? Now we we are thinking that multimedia would be the killer app in the next generation. And uh, we talk about the federated uh, AI in the form. See, uh, today if you look at classical AI, the models are limited by how good we train, right? Under what circumstances we train. Now in the federated uh, AI. you can actually have a much better global model because the federation the, the federated uis may be seeing completely different environments and the entire data on which they are training is completely localized to a specific place a specific use case and that will really uh, improve the global model right so hmm. in terms of workload while it could be multimedia centric or um, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, something on uh, the tactile internet uh, we are talking about internet of skills or we are talking about uh remote surgery happening so those kind of workloads even though we can of course say these are like classical workloads if we try to compare uh with the existing workloads but those kind of use cases may under different environments may see may see a different uh, different amount of training or different different way that we need to train the global model and with the federated ai that would really be enabled right and for for the wireless link it is really important for us to ensure that the latency and the and the, the kind of uh, data that is required for it to be sent in the uplink and downlink format so this is more like a uh, i mean we 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 always say right the uh, innovation actually happens on the edge of two disciplines so we know the multimedia the wireless and the ai mathematical model they all have to collaborate to really you know improve uh, this entire system that's what i feel sure yeah. sure it is uh, this uh, brings us to end of um, you know tutorial session thanks for the insightful tutorial i'm sure that you know um, the participants have largely benefited out of it and a sincere thanks uh, on behalf of vlsid committee okay thanks a lot yeah. have a great day Bye. thanks for the time